Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for coming to the Traverse Area Historical Society September monthly program. My name is Stephen Citrilliano. I'm the president of the board. And I'd like to welcome all of you, both members and friends, to the society for this presentation this afternoon. I want to especially thank the Traverse Area District Library for facilitating this and allowing us to record this so that for those that are would like to see the presentation again, or for the first time, uh, the library will provide that recording. As far as upcoming announcements, I just wanna let you know that our next monthly program will be on October the 17th at two o'clock, and it will include a presentation by two National History Day winners uh, on George Washington's farewell address and our annual meeting where we'll share with you the state of the meeting, or this, rather the state of the society and our uh, financial situation, as well as our upcoming programs. So let's turn today to the presentation. I'd like to uh, introduce Peg Siciliano, who is a member of our Historical Society Board, professional archivist and a recipient from a master's degree from in American History and Archives from the College of William and Mary. She'll present today on uh, helping you to date your photographs. So thank you all for coming and I'll turn it over to you, Peg. Okay, um, I'm just gonna comment a little bit. Uh, the two presenters at our October meeting are, I, I believe middle school students, yes, here from Traverse City that won on the national level so that they aren't just winners. Not that it's not important to win here in the local and state level also, but they went on to national and, and won national awards for their presentation. So it really is something special. And I will get started on my presentation, which I plan on being about an hour. I'll stop a couple of times in the midst of it to allow you to ask questions, or you can wait till the end and I'll stay, you know, more than an hour if that's how far the questions go. So I'm going to share, which we practiced earlier and it worked. So we will keep our fingers crossed. Are you seeing something on the screen now? Yes, okay, I'm going to make it bigger. Okay, um, I'm gonna scoop to the beginning. Okay, do you see a skeleton, a gentleman holding a skeleton on your screens? Yes, okay, then we are ready to go. Okay, it's an old saying, but oh so full of truth, a picture is worth a thousand words. This is certainly true of these two introductory photos. They are of and were taken by Orson Peck, a famous and somewhat infamous photographer of at least local fame. Take a good look at them as I start my presentation. We will return to Mr. Peck a bit later. For now, back to our pictures are worth a thousand words. I believe this is true but what of those photos to which we know we have some connection, but they lack any or are only minimally identified? How do we date such photos? How can we add to the story that they tell? Well, yes, such images present a mystery, but mysteries can be solved. And today I will give you hints as to ways that that can be done. We're gonna look at three different ways that you can approach this. You can look at clues in the background. You can look at fashion. You can research photographers. I guess there's four different ways and note evolving photographic methods. Now, during this talk, I'm not going to be able to tell you everything that you could learn about any one of these four things, but I hope to give you hints that will show you how to get started and where to go. Clues in the background. First of all, Doing some research ahead of time is a really good idea. Read some articles or books on the history of the photographs or the area in question. Check for historic timelines of the area. 
we have one here in town at www.traversehistory.org. If you go to that website, click the history icon, and then the timeline icon, you'll get a timeline, which will give you an idea of when things occurred in town. I would also suggest that either drive around the area if you're there, or look at maps, or today in the 21st century, you could even go to Google Maps and try to get an idea of the landscape and where things lie. When we used to work together over at the History Center, we'd get a picture, and I can't tell you how many times we all stood up holding the picture, turning around, trying to figure out what direction the photographer was looking. You know, were the hills in the background to the west of town or to the south of town? Because that would give us an idea of what buildings were in the photograph. And if we could identify buildings, we might know when they were built. So being able to have an idea of what the landscape looks like is very important. Now I'm going to go through some traversary history photos to give you examples of how such knowledge can, be help, can help in identifying and dating a photograph. On the left is the Hannah and Leigh Griss Mill. Imagine yourself today if you were from Traverse City or are living here now, standing on the Union Street Bridge, the south one, with your back to the post office. You're looking to the right, there's those really nice condos off to the right, the fish passes in front of you. That is where the Hannah Lake Grist Mill was from 1869 to 1926. So for example, if you know that and you're trying to identify what date the photograph to the right might have been taken, this is the Pierre Marquette Railroad Station in the left of that photo, but you can see the grist mill in the background. So obviously, if you know the grist mill was built in 1869, came down in 1926, this photo had to be taken between those two dates. Now we're gonna go back to Mr. Peck. This is a photograph of approximately the same location. The post office would be, today would be behind the person taking this photograph. In this postcard, it's marked the Pier Marquette Station. So theoretically, this big brick station is the one that took the place of that little wooden one that we saw back here. The point I'm trying to make is this brick station never existed. Orson Peck was infamous for photo, what we would say photoshopping today. So from the time photography started, Photographers knew how to do what we would call photoshopping or alter the picture. So you have to be very careful when you're looking at photographs to determine, am I really seeing what was there? Or maybe this is something that wasn't ever really there. And the more you know about the area and the no, more you know about the photographer, the better you will be able to make that kind of determination. Another way to be able to date photos. In fact, there's several of them in this photograph. Um, you can see the, what is now the Fifth Third Bank building on the Northwest corner of Front and Union is in this photograph. We know that building was built originally as the Traverse City State Bank in 190, I always get it mixed up as I think it's 04. Um, so this picture had to be taken after that. If you know anything about cars, you can look at the cars and say, ha, ah, the cars, those look like 1940s, early 1950 vehicles. Uh, if you don't know much about cars, you can Google it, get a hold of someone that does. Uh, what else can we look at here? Ah, to the left, you see Peter Till Drugs on the south side of Front Street. There are these wonderful things called pulp directories. They have them at the library. They start in about 1900 and go up through the present day. You can look things up by address. So you can look up an address or a business and find out where it was in that particular year. So you can find out, well, how many years was Peter Till Drug actually at this location? That will help you narrow down the number of years um, that that photograph could have been taken. The thing I really wanna point out though is the movie marquee. The movie marquee says James Mason in five fingers. 
Well, thanks to the computer, you can Google James Mason, Five Fingers. You find out that movie came out in 1952. By the way, the Michigan Theater is where Front Row Center is today on Front Street. Probably this is 1952 or 1953, given the cars, given the movie, the marquee, the movie that's showing. But you have to look for multiple clues to make sure they agree with each other. For example, it is theoretically possible that a movie could come back five years after it was put out. So it gives you a beginning date. It doesn't necessarily give you an ending date. However, you look at these vehicles and they also seem to say early 1950s. So you're probably pretty close. Another thing about cars, the same thing as with movies, cars may be built in 1935, but someone could still be driving one of those around today. So again, they give you a beginning date, but not necessarily an ending date. Another way, these photographs are both of West Bayfront. The one on the left, I did not date it exactly, but my guess is probably the 1950s. 30s, maybe even a little earlier. But if you look at that, and then you look at the one on the right, which is taken from the other direction, the one on the left looks east, the one on the right looks west, you can see Grandview Parkway. Well, if you go to our timeline, Grandview Parkway opened in 1952. So obviously, if this picture on the left had to be taken before 1952, the one on the right had to be taken after 1952. You can also look up some of the businesses. I happen to know this is the Firestone Station here. I don't have a pointer, but um, on the bottom left of the second photo, I could figure out when it opened. That would give me another idea as to when the photograph was taken. And then this photograph. If you've lived in town for the last 25 years, you probably recognize this. This was the Chamber of Commerce building in the northeast corner of Cass and Grandview Parkway. I call it the upside down building. And it was built in, it opened in 1965. And it, uh, I believe it was replaced. I would have to research this for an exact date, but I think in the mid to late nineties. So again, the picture had to be taken after 1965, before 1990 something. Also, the more you work with photographs, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, you'll just sort of start to recognize the look of this photograph. The colors in this photograph, to me, look sort of like a 1960s photograph. And the more you work with pictures, the more you'll sort of get that gut feeling because of the color or the texture or um, just how the surface looks to you. There are some cars far in the background of this. I'm not sure they could be enlarged enough to be able to date them, but it's a possibility. Okay, why is it? Well, this picture was working before, but now it isn't. So I want you to use your imagination. This is a picture of a young woman in a graduation gown, if you could see it. Uh, if you have a picture of, let's say your mother, graduating from high school. And you, know, you don't know what year she graduated from high school, but you know what year she was born. Knowing your family history is also helpful because if this were a picture of my mother and I knew she was born in 1927 and I know it, it's marked on the back, senior picture or graduation, then I can guess, well, it's 37, 40, 45, 44. Yeah, I can get a general date by looking at that. Another way to get a general date on a photo is to research the photographers. These two pictures are again, Orson Peck photos. Doing a little research, I found out Orson Peck lived from 1875 to 1954 and moved to Traverse City in 1888 with his family. I've also read that he started playing around with photography as a teenager. So very soon after he got to Traverse City, he was already taking photographs. And he lived until 1954. So a Peck photograph would have been taken somewhere between in Traverse City between 1888 
1954. That doesn't narrow it down a whole lot in Orson Peck's situation, but there are other photographers that when you go through the Polk directory, you find out they only had photography studios, studios here for like six years. So that can really help you narrow down the time frame. I wanted to show you one more Orson Peck photo before we go on to the next section of the presentation. This is one of his most famous photographs. It is a front street, again, looking west. You can see the old, uh, what is it now? The Fifth Third Bank in the distance there. You also see a trolley in the middle of the street. Well, if you are able to do a lot of research on Traverse City history, we never had a trolley on Front Street. In from 1898 to 1900, there were business people who were proposing putting a trolley on Front Street, but it never happened. This was actually probably taken and manipulated as part of that process of trying to raise money for the trolley but it never happened. So again, knowing the history of your area can be extremely helpful. I'm gonna stop real briefly. Does anybody have a question over this first section? I could take a couple now or wait till the end. You can just unmute if you want to. Nope, okay, I'm gonna go ahead. Wait, yeah, just one, yeah, yes. just one thing. Yeah, did you mention, did I miss it? What you would, date this uh, this photo of Orson Peck's with the trolley? Um, you know, because I know, because I read that this was done for the sake of the 1898-1900 um, effort to raise money for this, I'm guessing it's between 1898 and 1900. However, I have not done thorough, I know it could be because I see the first, the bank in the background. So that's, yeah. But the bank is 1904. It's 1904, yeah. Yeah, good point. Thank you, Helen. So this had to be done after 1904. Good, thank you for catching oh, that. Oh, and say copyright 1906 in the lower left. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh. there's like a um, hundred pictures in this presentation and um, it's like, Yes, just looking for the date of the photo could be helpful too. Um, if it didn't have a date on it, I could also look up the businesses in the Polk directory, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, so okay. um, good audience present, anything else? Thank you. Thank <laughs> no, you. You're welcome. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna go on. Um, and I know I appreciate people jumping in. I probably should have made this point to begin with. Um, I worked in a small archival repository, so I did a little bit of everything and I learned a little bit about everything. Uh, I would consider myself a semi-educated person about photographs and how to date them. There are archivists who their entire job, their entire you know, career and training is on working with photographs, identifying them, figuring out how to take care of them. I don't have that level, but I have a level that's somewhat better than probably the average person on the street. I do want to go to fashion now. Women's fashions, and to a lesser extent, children's and men's fashion, change every several years. Most resources that you're going to look at that are going to help you compare and decide on this, list them by decade. And a lot of them are photographs, 1880s, 1890s. But what you have to keep in mind is fashion doesn't change on the decade. So a fashion could come in in 1868, but mostly be used in the 1870s, probably be in the 1870s section, but you have to be aware that or a fashion might not come in until the middle of a decade. So they help, just be aware that those years are very movable as far as when something is popular. And of course, and I'll probably repeat this several times, just because something is out of fashion doesn't mean somebody isn't still wearing it. I mean, I have a dress in my closet that has shoulder pads in it from, I don't know, was that the 18, 1980s or the 1990s when shoulder pads came back on? I still wear it sometimes. So if somebody 50 years from now decided that me in that picture, it was from 1988, they'd be off by 30 years. 
because I'm still wearing that old dress occasionally. Same thing happened in the past. Um, fashion can tell you a lot. Um, beyond dating a photo, it can reveal occupations, membership in organizations, ethnicity, the financial status of the person wearing it, and sometimes even the geographic location. And I'm just starting with these two. The picture on the left is unidentified. I'm guessing it's probably sometime in the early 1900s. That's totally just a gut guess. I think it's a wedding picture looking at it, but the head, the, the hat, the, the, the top part makes me think she's probably Polish or some other middle European background. I am not an expert in that. If I was working really hard to find out more about this, I would do much more research because I can't tell the difference between a, you know, 19 hundreds, Polarman, Lithuanian, whatever. I can't tell that by looking. But I also know there's a lot of Polish people in the Traverse City area. So those are my clues that I'm starting with. The woman on the right, we know she is a Steinberg. There used to be another opera house in downtown Traverse City in addition to the uh, city opera house. It was run by the Steinbergs. They were a Jewish family. There were quite a few of them in town around the turn of the 20th century. I believe this is probably a 1990s photograph, 1890s photograph. When I first found it, I thought that little top knot, because I knew the family was Jewish, for a while I thought maybe that was an ethnic style. But I've, since then, actually while I was doing research for this presentation, I found out that no, that is really a more general 1890s style. So it's you know, whether it started with the Jewish community, I don't know, but it at very least spread beyond that. So even though I know this particular woman was at least ethnically Jewish, the fact that she has her hair in that little top knot may not have anything to do with the fact that she's Jewish. It was just part of the style at the time. So fashion is fun, but you have to take care. It does not change on a dime. Some of the things to keep in mind when you are using fashion is that, and this is very generally speaking, it's not going to hold 100% of the time, but usually new fashion started in the urban areas first, started with wealthier groups first because they could afford the new clothes. Younger people tended to adopt the fashion sooner than older people, and people may choose to wear old fashions. I love the photograph I have to the right because it shows you all the dangers that can come with trying to date by fashion. Uh, this, this is from 1847. It's the Traverse City Centennial Celebration. This photo is easy because you can see there are cars in the background. You know, obviously, oh, go ahead, yes, Helen. Yeah, no, I, you, I know, I know you, you was just a, 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 you didn't mean to say it. This photo is from 1947, not 1847. I say 18, I'm probably going to zop back and forth the whole time, but you know, try, do correct me. You're right. I, no, I have I, a hard time with it, but 1947, because, well, yeah, there's I, a lot of dates that people claim is the centennial, but this was like when the supposedly first white settler that actually came here and stayed here came here. Um, but not only are there cars in this photo, so it's obviously not 1847, but also the clothing these women are wearing isn't really 1847 either. I mean, it's, it's more like I think of it as Little House on the Prairie clothing, probably, probably more like 1860s. I'm not criticizing them. They were having fun. I'm just saying you need to, you know, keep all those things in mind as you're working with fashion. Peg, notice the uh, sign above the woman on the left. Okay. That's the, that's the Elks Club, BPOE. Yes, excellent point, because the BPOE, again, well, we, I know this is a centennial picture, but if I didn't, and I'm like, you know, what year was this? I'm just sort of beginning my Traverse City, learning about the history. I could track down when was the BPOE on Front Street, on this part of Front Street, because it moved. Well, my, my grandpa, Bert Gage, was the secretary there for 25 years, and I used to watch 
they have a big bay window up there and I'd watch the cherry festival sometimes from from when he parked me in the in the bay window up there Oh, that's wonderful. I've always wished I had someone with a house on, is it fifth? I mean, an apartment on Fifth Avenue to see the Thanksgiving Day Parade in New York. Yeah. That's the only way I would ever see it because I can't stand using porta potties. But anyway, on to the <laughs> too much information. On to the next. Oh, yes, back here. So I am going to focus on four decades. Obviously, there are a lot more decades that people may be wearing clothing on but I'm gonna use them as a way to point out the kinds of things you should look at and think about as you move to date by fashions. I'm gonna focus initially on women because their fashions tended to change more quickly and are easier to, to note. And then I will say a little bit about children and a little bit about men. With women's clothing, the easiest things to look at are the shape of the bodice, the length and shape of skirts and sleeves, accessories such as hats and jewelry, and hairstyles. So I'm going to start with the 1860s. And I call the 1860s the gone with the wind decade because that's where I got my initial idea of what people would be wear, women would be wearing in the 1860s. I had loved, I love that movie, even though I know it's got historical issues with it. Uh, but honestly, you look at these dresses and you do think, hmm, you know, they do look like Gone with the Wind dresses. And they were fairly accurate, at least in the shape of the clothing that they wear, wore. So let's look at what we are going to point out here. Um, 1860s, obviously hoop skirts, they got bigger and became more popular as the decade went on. They wore wide, often velvet belts around the waist. So there's a very defined waist. The sleeves were usually tight at the shoulder and then they either belled out at the bottom, which you can see in the middle photograph, or they get tight at the bottom and in both cases, it became very fashionable to have some kind of de decoration or lace, not lace, but ribbon on the bottom of the sleeve. Uh, capes were also very popular, as on the left-hand side. Hair was usually parted down the middle and pulled back. Now, I'm gonna go back to the 1860s in, the, in a minute, but I'm gonna jump into the 1870s now. The picture in the middle shows what, when you look at, and I'll give you some books, names of books in a little bit, but when you look at pictures and books, is that one of the typical 1870s hairstyles, still part in the middle, still pulled back, but with these ringlets or something coming down on either side behind the ears. Now, that is um, very interesting, but then look at the picture on the right-hand side from the Moblo studio. Her hair doesn't look like that at all. We know this is an 1880s photo because it was dated, the one on the right, but it's the late 1880, eight, I'm sorry, oh good grief, look at the screen, not my mouth, 1870s. We know it's an 1870s photo because it was dated, but that hairstyle uh, uh, on the right side with like the curly hair at the top, the bangs real curl at the top, that came into fashion at the end of the 1870s and became very popular in the 1880s. So although this is a late 1870s picture on the right, we're already seeing 1880s style come in. The picture on the left shows a bustle, and that's why I have it on. Bustles became very popular in the 1870s. Buttons down the middle, bustle on the back, the collar, rather than being around the waist, like it was in the 1860s, moves up to around the neck where they have the, the velvet collar. And the picture on my right is partly blocked by everybody's faces, but I believe she also has a collar on. The picture in the middle, something different at the neck. So it's rare that you will find the characteristics you're looking for in any one photograph. You have to sort of pick and piece them together. Also, if this is a family member, you use information about your family to help verify 
this would be the 1870s. Are you sure that woman in the middle is a, is a woman? Or that picture in the middle is a woman? <laughs> She's, they, they name her a woman. Yeah, she does look a very angular, but it's probably a woman. So uh, I just brought, oh wait, I went back, there we go. So this is just, you know, we may not know exactly when in the 1870s the picture on the left was taken, the picture on the right was taken in the middle of the 1860s, but there's an obvious difference in what they're wearing. And I looked for some newer books and asked a couple of archival archivist friends who are still practicing and they didn't really give me anything. So these are the ones I use and I find them to be really useful. I'm just gonna flop open this one on the left. Now there's a dating old photographs. I happen to have a more dating old photographs. I suppose you could get both, but as is typical, they are uh, placed either by decade or maybe every five years. These are photographs that were dated definitely by whoever took them or had them. So you know that they came from that particular decade and it's extremely helpful to, to be able to like put the picture next to this one and say, hmm, that sort of looks like that could be the right one. And then you go ahead and you look and oh, well, no, maybe it's the other one. And the same with the fact, the hairstyles on the right. Same woman, Maureen Taylor, who does have a, fat, a blog uh, on historic photos. I'm just gonna pop ahead to the 1880s. Um, so here, we're into the 1880s. You can see on the middle and the right-hand side, the women have those really distinctive curly bangs at the top, but the woman on the left does not. The, they still were wearing bustles in the 1880s, but they got smaller. And if you look on the left-hand side and you see the, a lot of ruffles on the bottom and this sort of the material that loops down um, almost to her knees, that was very much an 1880s, later in the 80s kind of style. I'm also guessing, again, just by looking at the dress, the woman on the far left, either you know, saved a lot of money up and spent it on that dress or her family was a little better off probably than the woman in the middle. Shoulders are still very um, tight. There's no big poofy anything going on here at the top. Uh, waistline, you can see the waistline, but you've got a bustle. And again, here I am comparing in the 1880s, the, um, the hip part of the top came a little bit lower than it did in the 1870s. She's not wearing that velvet necklace. Also in the 1880s, 1880s is when the development of cameras came to the point where they were easy enough to use that people were able to buy them for themselves and start taking their own pictures. So up until the 1880s, a lot of pictures were very formal because you, you had to get a photographer to take them or you had to take a lot of time to train yourself how to use the, the cameras. Into the 1880s, they started getting a lot easier to use and people started buying them and taking them around and taking pictures of their own events. Both of these pictures are of the Peter Till family from Traverse City. And you can see they're not stiff and formal at all. So they're having a lot of fun. Bicycles can help a little bit. Bicycles became very popular um, in the 1890s. These photographs are actually later than the 1880s, but they were the fun photos I found. Um, so if you see a bike, it's probably around 19. 1900 or later. Looking at the 1890s, so many things to talk about. In this photograph, I want you to look at the woman on the far right, and you can see the tops of her sleeves that her shoulders sort of have little peaks on them. 
That is an 1890s uh, clue. The woman in the, let's see, I'm sorry, but the, four, the third one over in the back, her shoulders are very flat. So my guess is this is early 1890s or she's wearing a slightly older dress. I, I can't tell by looking at this. The photo on the left, you can see how big those poofy sort of balloon slaves became in the 1890s. And on the right, I'm going to talk a little more about the little boy and that collar he's wearing is very much a distinctive late 1880s, 1890s clue for a photograph. And you can see with the woman, she has a little bit of fullness on the top. Again, it's blocked. I don't know how to make that go away, but there's a little bit of a, of a peak on her sleeve, but not nearly as much as the photo on the left. Gonna go back to Orson Peck's, Peck for a minute. This is one of his photographs. I'm not loony, only just spoony. And I'm bringing that up because <clears throat> one thing to pay attention, especially, well, in mostly in formal family photographs is it's likely that the person that's gonna have the most up-to-date, fanciest clothing on is gonna be the young woman who is closest to being of a marriageable age. Because these photographs were literally passed around and people were looking to match up or women were looking to get married, their families were looking to match them up and the family would dress up to its best, the clothes it could afford to look good so it looked like a family you would wanna marry into. And um, I have two examples of this. We have Serenus and Potter and family. Look at the girl on the right in the back. These clothes, none of them are overly fashionable, but she is obviously, in my opinion, dressed up a little bit more than probably her older sister in the middle. And I don't know if that would be, I don't know who these people are. I'm just pointing out how she has on a fancier dress. Look at the, dress, the photo in the right. Now this is probably a fairly well-to-do family, but the person with the fanciest clothing on is the girl in the middle sitting down in the front. And I think, I'm sorry that the picture is blocked again, but I doesn't one of the girls in back, can you see a wedding ring on her finger? I think this is the photo. She has like her hand resting on someone's shoulder. She has a wedding ring on. So I'm guessing that's an older sister. She's already married. I don't know about the two in the back, the other two in the back, but my guess would be the girl in the front is not married and probably the younger sister of the batch. As you see, I'm saying guess a lot here because I'm not using family history. I'm just going on one thing. It's a starting point. When we get into the 19 teens, all of a sudden you see big differences again. Now you've got uh, the waistline or the top begins to poof over the waistline. You have these bows in the back of the head. That's post 1900, when you start seeing those big bows in the back of the head. I chose these two photographs because the one on the left to me looks like either a store made or store bought or seamstress made dress. Could have been by a paid seamstress, could have been by a mother or a sister who was a very good seamstress. The one on the right, you can tell it comes from the same time period, but it's not quite as fancy. Maybe mom made that, um, but they're still very much the same time period. Oh, okay. Before we go back to Mr. <laughs> Mr. Peck, any like two questions on this? I wanna be able to at least get through the rest before three, but if I have I said the wrong date or I made a, obvious goof, I'm willing to correct it. I'm going ahead. Okay, we're gonna go back. We're gonna be talking about children. I wanted to throw in another cute 
um, Orson Peck postcard here to segue us into kids. I'm not exactly sure when this postcard came out, but I do know that in the 1920s, is there a date on it? I don't see a date. So <laughs> um, in the 1920s, it be, I won't go into it because I don't have time, but it became evident that Traverse City had a bad sewage problem. Studies were done and basically we had no sewage treatment plant and our drinking water was drawn out of West Bay, which was also, since there was no sewage treatment plant, basically everything just went down the pipes, into the creeks, into the river, into the bay. And the take-in pipe, pipe for city water was not very far away from the mouth of the Boardman River. And Traverse City was known nationwide as a hot spot for waterborne diseases. So people actually came to Traverse City to try to figure out, gosh, why are people in this little town having more, I guess, typhoid, whatever, whatever our waterborne diseases are. And there's really funny, well, only from, from the future looking back, there are articles in the newspaper where some of the town commissioners claim that it's okay to have the sewage coming in close to the water intake pipe because the water intake pipe was very low down, like close to the bottom of the bay and bacteria didn't float down. So even if there was bacteria coming in at the top of the water, it wouldn't float down to where the water came in. I don't know if this is Orson Peck's commentary on that, but it could be because he had a real sharp sense of humor. I do want to take it into children's fashion though, which is what we're talking about today. I focused on women's clothing because it changed most dramatically from season to season. But one thing about kids clothing, into the early 20th century, male and female babies and toddlers wore very similar clothing. So this is um, Manu Manuel Defoe from Manistee. He is a little boy. He has what looks like to us, he has on a dress but that was extremely typical in those years. So if you look at photographs pre uh, 1910, maybe, certainly in the 1800s, don't assume a toddler is a girl because the toddler has a dress on or what looks to a dress, like a dress to us. Also into the 1900s, children wore short, skirts and short pants until they were about 12 years old. After 12, the pants and the skirts would come down and they'd start wearing clothes much more similar, similar to whatever the style for um, adults was. Another thing I wanna point out in this photo is, and this holds most of the time, girls wore parts down the middle, boys wore parts on the side. And I would say my experience is this is correct about 80% of the time, not all the time. This is Julius and Albin Johnson. Two boys, I'm guessing, Julius and Albin, but how is their hair parted? It's parted down the middle, not on the side. So another rule of thumb, most of the time, a middle part will indicate a girl, a side part, a boy, but there are exceptions. I wanted to come back to this picture we had earlier and I want you to look at the little boy on the left, that lace collar he's wearing and the boy on the right of the other picture where he has sort of that big bow on. That is late 18, early, late 1880s, starting in 1886 into the 1890s. It's called the Little Lord Fauntleroy look. It's characterized by velvet and lace and very fancy collars for boys. It was based on a book written by a woman named Frances Hodgson, Hodgson Burnett. And the book was called Little Lord Fauntleroy. And little Lord Fauntleroy, it was very popular, wore velvet 
suits, lacy shirts, and ringlet curls. Now the boy on the left does not have ringlet curls, but he does have that lace collar. So again, a clue. Going to men's fashions. Men's fashions are harder to date things by because they didn't change as much or as often, but there are things you can look at. This is like an 18, 1986 book, but I did some Googling and it's still recommended as one of the best books on men's fashions. I don't have it, but if I were gonna be doing a lot of photographic dating or working with my family's things, I would certainly look into it. Some examples. Men through all of these decades tended to wear shirts and vests and jackets, hats often, and ties. There were changes over the decades, but they were subtle. So we know, I know this is an 1870s photo because it was dated. They're brothers from a family called Boone here in Traverse City. Things that are typical of the 1870s from the research I did is they tended to wear fairly wide ties that were tied loosely. So you look at the gentleman on the right, well, that fits. The other two are not wearing, I mean, they're wearing not, I don't even know what they are, ribbons rather than bow ties. So again, it doesn't hold for everyone, but it is there. They also tended to wear light mustaches and chin hair. Now that all four of them have that chin hair and the light mustache. So that would be something that would clue you in that that would be a date you could start thinking this is an 1870s photo. In the 1890s, there's a couple of things that just shout 1890s to me in this photo. The lace on the little boy down in the left-hand corner, the uh, top knot on the top of the woman on the back right, and that mustache on the gentleman on the far right. In the 1890s, what I usually think of as handlebar mustaches became very popular. Um, interestingly enough, you look at the clothing these people are wearing, there are none of those big balloon sleeves on the women that were very popular during the 1890s. But there are other things here that say to me, this is 1890s. These are also 1890s. Um, you see the must, they're wearing very nice mustaches. And the gentleman to the left, one of the things you would find if you research, ties were popular again, and they often were striped ties. I don't know how, I think it does show up here. You can tell that's not a solid, solid color tie. It's got some striping in it. And hats. Hats did change. They overlapped, but they did change. Bowler hats tended to be more in the 1880s. The straw hat that the gentleman in the bottom left corner has on is early 1900s. And I'm never quite sure what to call the caps that the men on the right in the right picture are wearing. But what I found last night, when I, they're called Great Gatsby caps. And they're very much 1920s. And again, you know, these can overlap each other, but it gives you a place to start. I'm doing pretty well time-wise here. Does anyone have a quick question about any of that? No, okay. I'm sorry, Peg, I just wanted to mention that of the three books that you put up there, the library does carry all three of them. Awesome. Uh, the fashionable folks, the hairstyles, and then the more dating photos, those are in the genealogy collection. And then the men's fashion is in our regular circulating collection. It's great, because that's a great way. Take it out first, find out, you know, if you're only gonna use it for a week, don't buy it. If you take it out and you use it and you find out, ah, I want this here every day, then it, but the, um, the first two are fairly inexpensive, or they, at least they were when I bought them, they're paperback. Uh, the other one looks a little more, 
more expensive. And then I've got a really one to show you here in a moment. So, <laughs> um, yes, Helen. Yeah, uh, yeah. This is a really a really broad topic. And I know, and you're talking. These are all almost all Traverse City or or Michigan or Midwest photos, uh, really broadly. But and as as you said, the fashions would come. You know, wealthier first, urban. So the, ver the variance between what we were wearing here in the 1860s, 70s, 80s, 90s, et cetera, compared to New York and, and Philadelphia. Yes, absolutely. Geographic yeah. also yeah. makes a difference because, you know, it, this is a stereotype, but there's some truth to it. It started in Paris, then it went to New York. Then it might go to Chicago, and then eventually it'll show up in Traverse City. So very good point, Helen. Um, so I do want to have time just to talk a little bit about photographic process. Uh, there's a lot to this. I'll show you the cover of this book on the slide in a minute, but you can see how thick this is. This is a Society of American Archivists book, which I don't know if Helen has ever seen it. It's not just about dating photographs. It's like everything you would ever want to know about identifying how they were made, how you keep them, how you store them, how you preserve them, copyright. It's wonderful, but it does have a great section on photographic processes. And I want to say quickly, too, is that today in the computer world, you can Google a lot of this and come up with some sites. Just be careful, like anything you do on the computer, try to make sure that if you Google, like, how do you identify photographs, have it, see if it's from the Smithsonian, you know, is it, is it from the National Archives, is, is the site from someplace where you know the people that have put it together are trained and really know what they're talking about. And that's not to say that someone else can't have trained themselves, but you don't know that. So it, like anything else you research, look at the source. Identifying photographic processes is another move that can be added to the bag of ways to establish dates. But as with most methods, this technique needs to be used cautiously and in combination with other clues. Because even though a photographic method has gone out of style, just because most people doesn't, don't use it anymore doesn't mean somebody isn't using it now. Um, you know, people that know photography can still figure out how to take a photo the same way someone did 100 years ago. So it's a clue. Uh, I put these two up here just to show, I don't know about other people, but I look at these and I'm like, ooh. Yeah, the one on the left, that looks color-wise, and I don't, I'm not an expert, so I can't tell you is it coat of color, coat of chrome, but it looks like a 1960s photo to me. I could use this and come much more closely to figuring that out. The photo on the right is a family photo of my mother and a friend of mine. And I know it was 1974. And the color just looks to me like a snapshot from the 1970s. Uh, if you were truly trying to date this without having any other information, does anyone see the Mr. Coffee coffee maker on the counter back there? You could do some research and figure out, you know, when did that style of Mr. Coffee Coffee Maker come out? Now, you know, my mom could have had that for 10 years and it just kept on working and kept on working and kept on working, but it would give you a beginning date. I happen to know the table in that photograph is actually from the 1950s because my parents kept it forever. <laughs> but, you know, it does help you set some kind of a parameter. I'm going to talk about three different kinds of photographic styles, just to give you the idea of the kinds of things you can look for to help you clue in. This, both of these photographs are tint types. When you look, if, when you research a tint type, you find out they started being taken in about 1856 and be, were stayed somewhat popular as long as 1930, but they were most popular in the eight, 1860s during uh, the Civil War. They're thin sheets of metal, so they're sort of easy to make an initial identification of because they're metal, um, iron, 
they're durable, they're very lightweight. However, they can scratch, the image scratches as you can see in this. They're often held in cases. They're usually a brown color, doesn't show up real well in this picture. Sometimes they look blue or yellow. And um, I get this mixed up, but if you do some research, you'll also find that depending upon the type of photographic process, photos may be reversed or not reversed. So it's just, it can be confusing when you're really looking with the photo and you think, well, that looks like, you know, the Boardman River looks like it's on the right, but, but everything else is on the left and that seems backwards. Well, the image might be reversed either because of the process it was taken or it was a copy that was made. Tent types, here are two more types of photographs that you may run into. The one on the left is called an albumin photograph. It's a paper print. The, um, the coating they put on it on the front of the photo was made out of egg whites. So it has a slight yellow tinge to it. And it's shiny, not like, not like a glossy photograph today, but shinier. Less shiny than that, but then shinier than matte paper. When you hold them up, you can sort of see. And they were popular between about 1850 and 1895. The blue photo on the right is a cy cyanotype. And what's distinctive about them is they're blue. <laughs> and they were developed in the 1840s, but they were used mostly in the 1890s into the early 1900s, almost always by amateur photographers, usually um, uh, photographic studios, professional photographers didn't much like the blue tinge. So it's almost always by amateurs, they're blue. The process is related to having a blueprint and the paper is really thin. So it usually begins to curl up a little bit. There are, ah, out of this book, there's charts in this book, or I'm sure you can find them online, where you can see how many different kinds of photographic processes there were. But this helps give you an idea, you know, about when did it start, when did it out of fashion, again, a place to begin, or a clue to add to other clues. I'm ending with Mr. Peck. This is Mr. Peck and there's a date on the photo. So we know when it was taken, September 19th, 1920. Um, this is Peck, some of his family members and his member and his um, neighbors on the Northland Limited leaving Traverse City. And with that, I'm leaving my formal presentation. But if somebody has some particular questions, I can stick around. I'm not on a, on a deadline here. Uh, I know I've thrown a lot at you. It's just a beginning, but hopefully you've gotten some ideas. So questions. That uh, Peck picture uh, with, the, with the little, uh, uh, looks like a brass um, or copper uh, boiler uh, that he's got upside down with 22. Would that relate to uh, M22, I wonder? You know, I don't know and I can't, I. I have people's, I don't know, I'm not very computer savvy. And for some reason, everybody's pictures are right over the right hand of my screen. I can't see it. It could be. Um, well, he, he cobbled together quite a, quite oh a my bit. Gosh. That was quite he, a you know, if you read that, a little bit. Of fun. <laughs> if you read a little bit about Orson Peck, he just seems like he was quite a character. I don't know if he yes. was like a lot of fun to be around or a pain to be around. I'm not sure. I've never read any. But it could be one or the other. But his photographs are, and some of his photos are beautiful and accurate. You know, it's not that everything he took was fake. Um, a lot of it was just really good pictures. So um, any, any other comments or my Oh, yeah. Yeah, Peg, um, and this is a, such a small point, but I know that there were several railroads. I know it came through Interlochen. Did he make that up? Is that maybe Grand Rapids and Interlochen Railroad or something else? Or, or is it just made up? 
Oh, maybe you didn't hear me. Oop. I think I think she's frozen. <laughs> so oh, we'll get, okay. We'll thanks. give her just a second, or maybe if Stephen runs back to his computer. Oh, sure. Thanks. Yeah, it's, it's an no? important point or question. <laughs> right. Did anyone catch the name of the last book that she put up? I think it was photographs, but I didn't catch the author. Did anyone see that? Oops. 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 <laughs> Oh, I think she said it was the American Archivists uh, Society. I mean, I okay, remember, but it was American Archivists Society, the book of uh, photographs or photography. Okay, I'll write that down and look. Well, it looks like both of them actually got kicked off. So I think we will end it here. Um, and we will also let everyone know um, next week or Hopefully we'll hear in the week or so if we're having, if they're going to have the Traverse Area Historical Society meeting via Zoom or in person. And hopefully the library will um, decide if we're doing in-person ones here in the next week or so. Um, but they'll well, let everyone know. Both, we hope. Yeah, I hope. Fingers crossed. Um, it's been really busy that it's been hard to try to figure, figure out how to do both, but we should. You would think with all the minds here, we should be able to figure it out. <laughs> so we have about three weeks to figure, or four weeks to figure it out. So yes. Well, but thank, thank you, you, for all, you for all your work there and on this coordination. It was very entertaining. I love it. Okay, great. Yeah, so thank, thank you, everyone. You. Bye -bye. You're welcome. Have a good night. Thank you very much. It was great. Good.